Today on the American Dream, and that's what I'm here to teach you, is that the American Dream is alive and well. That a former communist kid whose father risked his life being banished to Siberia had the foresight to bring us to the United States. And my goal is to transfer my immigrant edge onto you today. I'm a really fortunate guy. I get to do what I want, when I want, for as long as I want. I've got an amazing family, and I'm grateful. I've got an amazing team in Southern California who make me look great. I've helped eight people break seven figures. I've helped over 2,600 people break multiple six figures. And thousands break $100,000. In my industry, the average trainer makes $34,000 a year. Do the math on that. Now, I've been fortunate enough as a personal trainer and never realized it at the time when I first started that the people who are my clients are affluent, right? If you can afford four to $600 a month for a personal trainer, you probably have the money. And because they're affluent, they've persevered in life. They've made it. And it didn't take long for me to start asking them questions. How is it that you work out here three days a week at 1 o'clock in the afternoon when I know that you're a CEO of a company? And Jim Franco, my very first personal training client, said, kid, I make a little bit of money from a lot of people. That's one of the lessons I'll teach you on the next slide. But as people like Jim Franco... Joe Polish, who I was in a mastermind and coaching program with. Yannick Silver, who I was in a mastermind and coaching program with. Frank Kern, who you've probably never even met. Dan Kennedy, Jay Abraham, who I've paid tens of thousands of dollars to. To coach me, consult me. I'm standing on their shoulders. I paid $25,000 that I didn't have in one lump payment to Joe Polish to join his mastermind program. But I can tell you it's because I surrounded myself with winners. See, years ago, once we started making money, my wife and I took a cruise to Alaska. And as this, the Oostradam, the cruise ship, docked in Ketchikan, and we got off the ship, we're walking and I see a guy with this five-gallon paint bucket casting a net, and another one, and another one. And I was curious, so I walked up and I looked in the bucket, and he had these crabs, right? There's about five or six crabs and maybe this much water in this five-gallon bucket. And you know what? One of the crabs was super ambitious. This little fucker was climbing on top of all the other crabs, right? <laughs> And he was reaching way up there for the lip of that bucket to free himself. He was going to make a run for it. I was a good Samaritan. I said, sir, your crab's about to make a run for it. He goes, no, no, no. Watch what happens. I go, no, 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 you should put the lid on. I see you've got the lid. Put the lid on. He goes, just watch what happens. So as this little ambitious crab is reaching up there and yanking himself up, all the other little crabs at the bottom reach up, grab them by the hind legs, and pull them right down. It's instinctive for crabs to do that. They're self-policing. I'm hitting my wife. Did you see that? Did you see that? Because guess what happens? In that moment, I realize I'm that little fucking crab trying to get out. <laughs> and I'm surrounded with all these other fucking crabs in my life who are pulling me down, telling me I can't do it. My ideas are stupid to create a software for online personal training. Nobody will ever use it. Guess what I did? It was making $25,000 a month. Then I created another software, FitPro Newsletter. Itself, FitPro Newsletter makes over a million dollars a year. Over 2,000 personal trainers use it. But people were laughing at me, telling me I can't do it. How can you do that? You can't even start a supplement company. You maxed out your, cup, your, your, your credit cards to start selling supplements on the internet, you ended up in living in a fucking car. Now you're going to do software genius? You can't do that. I had crabs in my life. All of us are surrounded by crabs, and we forget that we are the CEO of our own lives. And as a CEO, you can promote, demote, or terminate. 
anyone in your life. And in that moment, I decided that that's what I'm going to do. There are friends from high school that I don't talk to anymore. Is it cold? I don't know. You decide. There's family that I've limited exposure to. Maybe you can't cut family out, right? But you can limit exposure, and you can limit what you talk to them about. So you've got to learn to cut the crabs out of your life if you want to succeed. What else have I learned from my mentors? That money is simply a vehicle to freedom and nothing else. Whatever hang-up you have about money, let it go. Money's bad, money's evil, it's the root of all evil, bullshit. Had it not been for the money that I have last year, I would not have been able to take 11 remains of soldiers out of the L.A. County morgue and give them a proper burial because their families could not afford to take them out of the morgue. I don't want the applause. Thank you. Money is attracted to value. Listen, you're not greedy if you have a lot of money. If you have a lot of money, unless you're selling crack or something, if you have a lot of money, it's because you've added value to someone's life. What else have I learned from my mentors, from the people that I've surrounded myself with? That 99% of partnerships fail. If you're going to go into a partnership with someone, they better bring something so valuable and so unique that you can't get or bring yourself. It's the only reason you're going to go into a partnership. Sadly, most of you will go into a partnership, because I did, for the fact that you don't believe in yourself, and you believe that that partner might be the man on the white horse. The man on the white horse does not exist. You are the man or the woman on the white horse. Gallop in, save the fucking day yourself. Right? That's it. I've had business partners screw me, employees screw me, consultants that I've hired at $25,000 a month screw me. But it's okay because I thought that there's someone else who knows more than me. I didn't give myself enough credit. Take that lesson as an entrepreneur and apply to your life today. 99% of partnerships fail. Now, having said that, the guy who's going to speak on stage tomorrow morning, Craig Valentine, is a dear friend and a business partner of mine. Things could not be better. I've had six business partners. Only two have worked out. Only two have worked out. Craig and I run a coaching group together. He brings in something very unique and special. I bring in something very unique and special, and we complement each other. You also need to understand that you've got to be the guy or gal that signs the front of the check and not the back of the check. I needn't say more about that. But if you are in a position right now where you're signing the back of the check, other than if you're giving yourself payroll, right? Hopefully that's direct deposit, because I'm a big fan of time management. If you're still taking a check to the bank, there's something wrong with you. Direct deposit or get an assistant. Sign the front of the check. Have control over your life. You know, the word control freak has a bad connotation, but I don't think it should. See, I like to reframe things. I like NLP. I like self-help. I like reframing things for myself. And for me, control freak. Now, don't I want to control my health? Sure. Does that make me a control freak then for exercising, eating right? No one, no one laughs at me for being a control freak about my health, about my finances. Why wouldn't I want to control every other aspect of my life? So I'm not a control freak. I'm a control king. Right? That's the way I look at it. Because I'll never be in a position, because I've been in this position, where out of the blue I was making good money, and then someone goes, in two weeks we're shutting down or downsizing your department. I don't know if that applies to you because we're a room full of entrepreneurs. And if it doesn't apply to you, that's fantastic. And you've got the obligation to pass this along to other people. Not to your employees, obviously. Right? But pass it along to other people who have the entrepreneurial spirit. Force them, encourage them, inspire them to sign the front of the check and not the back of the check. That's when true freedom is built. I've surrounded myself with a lot of winners 
and I continue to seek out winners. Last year at this event, I met Kevin Harrington. You guys remember Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank? First couple seasons, as seen on TV, he was here at this event talking. Guess what? It was his turn to get up on stage and talk. His PowerPoint took a crap. I was up after him, just like I was up after Frank today. By the way, Frank Shamrock, great, amazing guy. Had the funnest time filming with him and Randy Couture. Um, is he in here? No, he's a big pussy. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> he probably is in here. I can't see with all the lights. But uh, great guy. Love him to pieces. And uh, uh, quickly became great friends with him as well. But Kevin Harrington was in here. And so I said, hey, Kevin, no worries. PowerPoint's not working. I don't need my PowerPoint to get it done. You guys figure it out back there. I took the stage and did my whole presentation with the marker, on a marker board and ironically won the Best Presenter Award. After that, he thanked me. I came to him with a giving hand. Sure, I wanted to use my PowerPoint. Sure, I had you know, stuff to teach. That's OK. If I can help someone, I will, right? Do the right thing even when no one's looking. In this case, there was hundreds of people looking. But I felt the right thing was I can get up there and speak rather than drag it along while they're trying to figure out what's going on. I wasn't going to be selfish and go, gee, I need my PowerPoint, and gee, I need to speak when I need to speak. So what? I'll go up an hour earlier. Big deal. And I did. And he thanked me. He later on ended up speaking at one of my events. Today, we're business partners. And in the fitness industry, we're launching a thing called Hitch Kevin Harrington. As you know, he's brought a lot of exercise equipment to the market space, right? The Gazelle, Tony Little. The Jacqueline Juicer, workout videos. So we hit it off. Surrounded myself with another winner. But it came with the giving hand. Always give first. But what Jim Franco taught me was continuity. Take a little bit of money from a lot of people. So you guys are in the martial arts space. You guys do membership, right? That's no surprise to you. But what else can you do? Do you have information in your brain that you could sell online? and not to just the local people in your community? If so, listen to what Craig's going to teach tomorrow. He's going to teach you how to take the knowledge and the expertise and the information you have and sell it on the internet, where you can reach masses with your knowledge, generate another income stream, create more continuity, whether it's a one-time sell or a membership site online, where it's month after month of people giving you payment. In your current business, this here will add millions of dollars to your life. Ascension. Ascend people up the ladder. There's 20% of your customers who always want the next biggest thing. That's why even though there's Chevy, Ford, Toyota, and Honda, there's BMW and Mercedes. And even though there's BMW and Mercedes, there's 20% of those buyers who want the Bentley. And there's the Bentley, and there's 20% of those buyers who want the Rolls Royce. Do you follow? Some people just want the best that you have. It's an irrational purchase. Ascend people up. Are they paying you monthly? What other service or value can you add to their life to get them to pay again and again and again? Oh my God, take all that money from them? Yes, because you're going to add value. You're going to speed up the outcome that you've promised to deliver them. You're going to get them in better shape, build confidence faster, self-esteem, self-defense. Whatever it is that you're offering, they're going to get it faster, better, with greater service when you create an ascension ladder and move people up that ascension ladder and charge more for it. There's always 20% of your customer base who wants to pay you more for something else. And finally, price elasticity. Someone yell it out. What is the average monthly fee that you guys charge? 150, 135. All right, so let's say 150 being the average. Why? Probably because the answer is going to be, well, that's, that's the going rate. That's what everybody else charges. That's what my competitors charge. Who gives a crap? I'm selling to personal trainers who on average make $35,000 a year. There's six other people like me in the fitness industry. I don't know how I did it. I ended up being the guy at the top. I believe just being genuine and telling people the truth. If you're horrible at marketing, 
I'm the trainer that told you. If you're a trainer and you're fat and out of shape, I'm the trainer that says it. I haven't trained a client for 11 years now. That picture was taken a few months ago with the surfboards. I'm in better shape than 90% of the trainers out there, sadly. And I tell them. And while there's six other people who do what I do, two of them have been around longer than I have. They charge an average of eight to $10,000 a month for a year of coaching. I charge $25,000. I'm sorry, they charge eight to $10,000 a year. I charge $25,000 a year. I have more coaching clients than I know what to do with. Price elasticity. 150 bucks a month. Why? Why not 250? Why not 350? What can you do to demonstrate that you're so much better to justify a higher fee? Dramatic demonstration of proof. Nothing else beats that. See, what I do in my market is I put the Michael Perellas up on stage. Hey, here's another guy that I helped create seven figures plus. Here's another guy. Here's another guy. In the fitness world with our franchise, Fit Body Boot Camp, we constantly put transformation pictures out in front of the community. We don't sell boot camp. We don't sell workouts. We don't sell boot camp. We don't sell personal training. That's not what we sell. We don't sell exercise. We don't sell access to equipment like a gym does. See, Fit Body Boot Camp owners don't compete against personal trainers or other boot camps. While everyone else is selling martial arts, or in my world, fitness, we're selling the outcome, the results. And so we'll charge more than all other boot camps in the community. But we always demonstrate dramatic proof. You're charging what you think you're worth. Turns out you're worth more if you can justify why. And finally, one of the big lessons that I've learned from surrounding myself with winners is you've got to learn to outmarket everybody. Lesson number two, simple enough. Always take action. So what does that mean? That means you leaning to the size of your comfort zone. There's this box that we all live in. It's homeostasis. It feels safe. It's good. It's the known. But anything good that's ever happened to you has happened to you when you stepped outside of the comfort zone. I now do all types of six-week challenges. I hired a professional MMA fighter, and he trained with me for six weeks, got in the ring with me, and we fought at my level. Remember, I told you I'm not a fighter. That was way out of my comfort zone. I took guitar lessons, and I can strum a lot of Jack Johnson songs, and I love that. Right? I'm going to do salsa dancing next. Don't know how to dance, but I think it'll be fun. It's way out of my comfort zone. And the more I step out of my comfort zone, the more it's, it kind of bleeds into every other part of my life, in business, in personal relationship, self-esteem, confidence. Right? I can't just sell myself on the idea that I'm just this guy who knows how to sell and market to the fitness industry, and I'm designed to lift weights, and that is all. That's bullshit. And as it turns out, I'm glad I did that whole MMA thing for six weeks, because my wife and I and the kids were coming back from Maui two years ago. And as luck would have it, I travel all the time, by the way. Nothing happens. I read my book, fall asleep, wake up, we're there. This one time, my wife and kids were in an airplane, and there's a dude who's a flight risk. He's doing the gun gesture, he's yelling, he's screaming, and I see that the flight attendants have two zip ties put together, and they're walking down the aisle on my side, and you think that the people way up there where this guy is would tackle him down, right? They don't. For the record, all you guys in martial arts, they don't. They don't. 9-11, it's gone by long enough, and people have forgotten what happens, right? So I'm like, holy fuck. My kids are sleeping, my wife's looking at me like, what's going to happen? I'm like, I have no idea. So as the flight attendant comes by, I'm like, grab her arm, I'm like, ma'am, what's going on? Anything I can do to help? He's a flight risk, and we have to ask him to put this on. I'm like, what do you mean ask him? Like, force him, right? No, no, by law, we have to ask him. How are you going to do that? He's, like, freaking out, right? So she goes, and I see her, like, doing, making this gesture. The two other flight attendants are with him, with her, and he starts freaking out even more. She looks at me. He goes, you got to help. You got to help, <laughs> right? I get this one. I'm like, all right, about 40 of us are going to rush this guy. I'll be the guy on top since I'm probably the heaviest, right? We'll show him. I get up. I'm the only one going there. I'm like, fuck, what do I do? Thankfully, one other guy came. And before you know it, I did exactly what Aaron had taught me. Aaron was the guy who taught me the MMA training. Aaron Weatherspoon, he's a UFC welterweight champion. Not UFC, I'm sorry, uh, king of the cage. Um, 
UFC, uh, King of the Cage welterweight champion. And as soon as this guy went to push me, I just did a little parry and found myself in a rear naked chokehold. Choking the guy out. Dropped him. Now the guy had to put the zip ties on. So I got him in a, turned around on a guillotine chokehold. The guy put the zip, and, and I'm freaking out the whole time, like, holy shit, right? But that training came in handy. How awesome is that? Of course, we landed, I'm texting Aaron, like, you won't believe what happened. LAPD comes in, does their thing. Anyway, and we got a whole bunch of free uh, champagne and chips and hummus on the rest of the flight. <laughs> it was great. My, I woke my kids up. They're slept through the whole thing, right? I figured if they're going to die, they're going to fall asleep. They're not going to be awake for it. <laughs> yeah, thank you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, enough of that. But another great example of always taking action. Now, obviously, my family was with me, and there was an incredible sense of urgency to take action. But nobody else got up. Right? Just always take action. You see opportunity, take it. You got to get off the bleachers and get on the field. That's where the excitement is. That's where change happens in life, man. And you're probably thinking, okay, I'll start taking action from now on. As soon as I get everything perfect on this thing, I'm going to take action and launch my new program, my new marketing scheme that they taught me, my new sales process. Guess what? I got news for you, genius. Perfect never happens. So you've got to start taking imperfect action. Write that down. I will start taking imperfect action. And what else are you going to do? You've got to stay on the cutting edge, man. You're going to create faster than they can copy. And here's why. You are on the razor's edge. You are the tip of the spear in your industry, right? There's thousands of martial art places worldwide. There's like 400, I don't know, maybe 500 people in here. What does that tell you? You are the tip of the spear, which means that you are going to be the one that gets copied. You can't get frustrated and, oh, man, fuck that. You will create faster than they can copy, right? That's it. What does Apple do? All Apple does is creates faster than they can copy. What does Google do? Creates faster than they can copy. And you've got the GSD every day. What does GSD mean? Get shit done. Get shit done. Get shit done. All your ideas are useless. Useless. Unless you bring it to fruition until you get shit done. See, as entrepreneurs, we also suffer from a disease. It's a very deadly disease. And this disease comes to you by this little fucker with the wings. The idea fairy. The idea fairy will come to you when you're working on something important and goes, you know what? Here's a better way you can do that, man. Yeah, that's right. Let me just fucking zig and do it that way. And let me zag and do it this way. You can't. You can't let the idea fairy give you that disease. Right? You got to stand that straight line. Just get shit done. Get thing number one done. It'll be imperfect, but you'll launch it, and you'll take action on it. And you'll seek out the help of others who can coach you, mentor you, consult you. And thing number three is to never peak in life. The best is yet to come. You guys have all seen The Sopranos? Right? Tony Soprano says, remember when is the lowest form of conversation that any two people can have. Hey, man, remember when back in high school on the football team? Man, those were our heydays. You remember when in college? Fuck that. Never peak. Like, my goal in life is that, like, right on my deathbed, I learned my last lesson. I read my last book, and I peaked and I died. That's what I want to happen. I don't want to live, I don't want to peak and then die four days later. I think I'll be like four days that I was living in the heydays. I'm neurotic that way, but so should you. So I'm asking you, what is the story that you've sold yourself on, right? What's the soundtrack of your life? Oh, man, I'm that guy that got burned in the 87 the economy crash when the stock crashed, and because of that, blah. who gives a shit? In 87, I was dumpster diving, you know? Who was around when the stock market crashed back then? Who was around when it crashed recently? All right. Who's going to be around when it crashes again? Ta-da! Look at that. Am I a stock genius? No. It's predictable. It's going to crash. We can either panic, or we can make money and add value to the lives of the people. Right? Guys, I was dumpster diving for crying out loud in 87. 
we came here in 1980. In 87, I was still dumpster diving. My dad would take me to like the, the, the Ralphs, the Kroger's, the, the, the grocery stores, and he dumped, pushed me into the dumpster behind those places. And I, my job was to pick out the food that was expired but hadn't gone bad yet. So I was the smallest one in the family, right? Easy. It's fucking easy. See, I've been poor and I've been broke. And so what I want to do is transfer that on you. Now, I might be broke again in my life. I might make a big multi-million dollar decision, and it might go wrong, and I'll go broke. And I've told my wife this. But I'll never be poor again. You broke is when you just don't have money. Poor is a state of mind. You got to understand the difference. You guys are all entrepreneurs. You'll take a risk. You might end up broke, but you should never end up poor. See, we came to the United States, we were poor and broke. Because I would hear my dad hemming and hawing about, maybe I made a bad decision. We came and the economy crashed here. Now to me, it was still better than how it was there because there was no KGB kicking in our door to inspect our house in the United States, like there was in Armenia. So my dad was starting to doubt whether we made the right decision, and he would verbalize that, and I would hear it. And it became the soundtrack in my mind. So what is the negative self-talk? What is that loop that's playing in your head? Stop it. Reprogram yourself. This life is not a trial run. This is not a trial run. Like, this is it, man. You got people to help, lives to change. So you're going to never peak. The best is yet to come. So you always, always, always surround yourself with winners. Take action and never peak. Those are the big lessons I've learned in life. And let me tell you about the immigrant edge. That little kid right there, that's me in the green. I don't even want to know where my sister is. My sister should have been in that picture. She was probably working when that picture was taken because they all had like eight jobs. I was the baby of the family, so my job was just to sit at home and eat Velveeta cheese. It was given to us by the government. I could tell this day I could make so much shit with Velveeta cheese and bologna, it'll knock your fucking socks off. It'd be an amazing <laughs> too. Yeah. Yeah. You guys find your way to Chino Hills. You're coming to my house. We're going to have Velveeta cheese and bologna sandwich. My wife just gags. But that's me, man. That's, that's a couple years. That's probably 1982, 83. No one's smiling but me. I'm fucking happy to be in the United States. It's the immigrant edge, man. Right? I've seen how bad life can be. And no matter how bad you think you have it, you don't. You're not dumpster diving. No one's washing your hair in the, in the, on the green grassy patch uh, in your apartment complex with gasoline that my dad had to pump out of the car. He pumped gas out of the Ford LTD so my mom could wash my hair with gasoline. All the neighbors are watching, thinking she's going to light my shit on fire. <laughs> but I had lice, and we couldn't afford lice treatment. So I was doubled over as my mom's cussing me out in Armenian for getting lice and scrubbing gasoline into my hair. Some foreign lady just going off, right? People are like, she's going to light this fucker on fire. He's going to go up like a tinderbox. This is going to be awful. Everyone wants to watch. If they had iPhones, they, they, this thing would be on Facebook, right? So if I can pass any message to you, man, it's the immigrant edge. I want you to have that fucking edge. Life is awesome. Life is not bad at all. We have a great thing going on here. Today I get to surf, get to hang out with my beautiful wife and kids. I'm very blessed and fortunate that I can share this message with you guys.